Queen Elizabeth II arrives at Westminster for the opening of Parliament, the start of another year in the government of Britain. The splendour of the occasion is part of a tradition founded and developed in the days of Britain's imperial past, when Britannia ruled the waves and much of the world as well, when power went hand in hand with prosperity. Today the ceremony remains, but the realities of the world have changed drastically, and Britain's fortunes with them. As politicians of both government and opposition marched into the House of Lords to hear the Queen's speech, all were aware that Britain was in its worst economic crisis for more than 40 years, and that the coming year was going to be another round of austerity and sacrifice. Further opportunities for the exploration and development of the nation's valuable petroleum resources will arise from the grant of further licenses following the very satisfactory response to the recent round of offshore licensing. For many Britons, these are hard times. 17 years ago, Harold Macmillan won an election on the slogan, you've never had it so good. But the easy affluence that made such a claim possible has long since disappeared. For many ordinary people, it's now an uphill struggle to balance the family budget. In the last two years, Britain has suffered one of the highest inflation rates in Europe. Price increases reached a peak in June 1975, when they were running at nearly 40% a year. Since then, emergency measures have brought the rate down sharply, but it's still not reached the single-figure target the government was aiming at, and it's now hovering around 14%. Even a 14% inflation rate is well above most other European countries, and for many Britons, it means a real cut in living standards, because wage increases have been held to only 5% since the middle of 1975, and the government wants further restraint for at least another 18 months. For the one and a half million unemployed in Britain, the pinch is even more severe. Those without work now account for 6% of the total labour force. The welfare benefits paid out to the unproductive are a sizeable factor in government spending, which is running at record levels. With little immediate prospect of industrial growth, the number of jobless is unlikely to dwindle in the near future and even the longer-term prospects for employment are pretty gloomy. Industrial production has been stagnant for the last 12 months, and the hoped-for recovery of the international economy, which looked like taking off in the middle of 1976, has not been sustained. In all industrial countries in the last few months, forecasts of economic growth have been revised sharply downwards. For a country like Britain, which earns its living from international trade, these latest indicators are depressing news. For without expanding markets for its exports, Britain cannot begin to cut down its enormous balance of payments deficit, which has so undermined foreign confidence and sent the value of sterling tumbling on the currency markets of the world. Throughout this year, the pound has taken a hammering, with daily drops in its value of more than five cents against the dollar. In March 1976, sterling fell below the psychologically important $2 mark for the first time, and in October was actually approaching $1.50. It's rallied a bit since then, but this galloping devaluation has forced the government into crisis measures, like a 15% base interest rate to keep foreign-owned funds in London, and huge international loans to bolster the reserves. Devaluation has both good and bad consequences. The lower sterling sinks against foreign currencies, the cheaper and more competitive become Britain's exports. But by the same rule, imports become correspondingly dearer, and these increased costs work their way through the economy to give a fresh twist to domestic inflation. 
In the case of raw materials for manufactured goods, dearer imports eventually mean dearer exports too, and so offset the competitive advantage of devaluation. It's this vicious circle that Britain has to break before real economic recovery can begin. Latest trade figures show that while the value of exports has risen substantially, the volume has not, suggesting that British exporters are content to take the windfall profit from devaluation rather than lower their prices and expand their markets. The pound's vulnerability is made worse by the so-called sterling balances. Large deposits held by foreigners, especially the Arab oil producers, from the days when sterling was the world's major trading currency. The movement of these balances into other currencies accelerates the decline in the pound's value far more than Britain's economic performance would justify, and thus can nullify all attempts to stop the rot. The British government's now seeking international help to fund the balances. Sterling's plight has brought an invasion of foreign tourists from Europe all flocking in to buy British in what for them is a bargain hunter's paradise. Special holiday come shopping charter flights have been booked out by the Continentals and London stores have had to take on scores of interpreters to help transact business. The Europeans, especially from Germany, France and the Netherlands, are delighted to find a wide range of clothes and consumer goods at half the prices they'd have to pay in their own countries. Meanwhile, the responsibility for curing Britain's ills rests with Prime Minister James Callaghan and Chancellor Dennis Healy. They've enlisted the support of both sides of industry, unions and management, and in the forum of the National Economic Development Council, they've tried to plan an agreed strategy. Part of the strategy is to shift more of the country's resources into manufacturing industry and out of less essential services. In the middle of 1976, the Prime Minister seemed optimistic about the eventual outcome. It is um, my own view, speaking as I have the honour to be as head of the government for the time being, it is my own view that, if, uh, that with the change in atmosphere that took place in the middle of last year, the great sense of realism that permeates the whole of this country today about our economic situation. That if we can work together over the next two or three years on ensuring that British industry and the trade union movement gets itself into a position where we can be fully competitive, that we can prepare ourselves for the 80s, and I firmly believe that with the degree of cooperation that we're building up, although we should all have our differences, but with the degree of cooperation that's building up, that this country has got a better chance of having a sustained recovery and a new upturn in its standards than it has had for the last 30 years. That was in July, but since then the situation's got worse. Increased employer taxes and higher interest rates have created more uncertainties in the minds of industrialists about future prospects and damaged business confidence. Production has not picked up. Uh, gentlemen. At board meetings throughout the country, investment decisions are being put off until prospects look brighter. This was a meeting of a Midlands industrial group in October. Chief Executive John Briggs could find no support for an immediate commitment of funds. Paul, we have discussed this large investment project at some length. Uh, is it your opinion that we should, in fact, defer this project and this investment? No question. We must defer. We must defer. Yes, I think we should certainly defer it for a period of time. Yes. I wonder what period of time. I think at least three months. Do you? I would have thought three months is the minimum that we should take before we reconsider the whole situation. Afterwards, we asked Mr. Briggs if he wasn't being too pessimistic about the future. I don't uh, think so. Uh, I want to see some government action now. We cannot drift on as we have been drifting on for so many years. I think our Prime Minister Callaghan made the point of the malaise of the last 30 years. We've reached the end of the road. We've reached a position where we have no more borrowing facility available. We have to understand that in this country, we cannot spend more wealth 
than we create. The creation of wealth must become our prime objective. I think it was Macmillan in Africa who said that he felt a wind of change. In my opinion, we need a hurricane of change at this moment. And then, and then alone, can we start the road to recovery. For Chancellor Healy, the road to recovery first had to be cleared of impassable obstacles, and the greatest of these was the vulnerability of sterling. In late September, with the pound under particular pressure, Mr. Healy cancelled at the last minute a visit to the International Monetary Fund meeting in Manila and announced that Britain would apply to the fund for a standby credit of $3.9 billion. At the Manila meeting, there was a lot of speculation behind the scenes about what sort of conditions the IMF would demand in return for this facility, a loan which would in fact exhaust Britain's international credit worthiness. In the event, the IMF sent a special team to London to scrutinize British government policies. And after protracted discussions, it became clear that Mr. Healy would have to recommend to his cabinet colleagues substantial cuts in government spending if the loan was to be secured. What happened in the meeting, Chancellor? Well, we had a most useful and interesting discussion. What was the mood of the meeting, Chancellor? I think it was a... Uh... Friendly and uh, concerned. For a socialist chancellor to urge cuts that would diminish a whole range of social services was unacceptable to many left-wingers, especially in the trade unions. Opposition to the very idea of cuts in public spending was expressed in a huge trade union march through London in November. At the rally which followed, union leaders didn't mince their words when attacking government policies. The General Secretary of the National Union of Public Employees, Alan Fisher. It is a damning spot on our society that when we know all those things that we need to do, and we know that we've got at the same time 1,500,000 people unemployed being paid out of the public purse that we don't do something in a job creation pro program that really matters by putting people into the public services so that they could have jobs and so that they would be costing the nation no more than it's costing at the moment and we would be making a sensible economy in public spending instead of some of the economies that are being talked about at the present moment to satisfy the greed of international financiers. Solid union support is essential to the government's policy and indeed probably to its survival. The powerful unions like the miners have so far cooperated on pay limits and their consent to another round of wage restraint will be needed next July. So Mr Healy has to be careful not to alienate them by measures in a mini budget that might increase unemployment or curtail social services. It was a point made by Len Murray, the General Secretary of the Trades Union Congress, which represents all the big unions. If he gets this mini budget, if there's going to be a mini budget, very wrong, then I reckon my members are going to start telling me pretty fast he's got it wrong, and they're going to start telling me pretty fast that he's not on for something further next July. But I'm not making that assumption yet. Now, the unions, in many people would say, have been fairly tolerant in maintaining this special relationship with the government in the face of massive unemployment. Is there going to come a stage at which you will draw the line? I've always known that the could come a stage at which you draw the line. It would be nonsense to say that whatever happens, whatever happens, you know, the, the TUC goes on being as tolerant as you say. Uh, I don't think that line is going to be drawn in as a result of these negotiations, but I'm only guessing. I don't think it is. For the employers, John Methven, Confederation of British Industries Director General, had no doubt what the Chancellor should aim for. We have to get more people back into trade and industry. You know, over the last 10 years, we've created one million new jobs in central and local government. And we've lost three quarters of a million jobs in trade and industry. Now, we've got to switch them back so that we can afford all those social services. That means a transitional problem. We've got to cut public expenditure. Let's cut it where we can without creating unemployment. But let's make sure 
that trade and industry can expand again, that business confidence comes back. Mr Methven, is your basic message to the Chancellor that Britain doesn't need a mini-budget? No, it isn't. What we're saying is this. Public expenditure is much too high. It's gone from 50% of our national income to 60% over the last three years. We've got to cut public expenditure reasonably, 5% over five years, and we've got to give incentives back to people. They've got to be able to take home more of what they actually earn. Now, we need a mini-budget to do that so that we get business confidence back. You know, it's slipped to a very major degree over the last three months. Whatever the final decisions, it's clear that Britain still has a long way to go before solving its problems. And the traditional celebrations in many households this Christmas will be tempered more than usual by a mood of cautious economy.